Welcome everyone to the webinar. We're gonna get started here in just a minute. Thanks for joining and for being here today. And uh, we're gonna give you all just a few minutes to uh, get connected as we have a, a quick stream of participants joining us. So we'll be back with you in just a minute. Welcome everyone to this webinar on protected area rangers on the front lines of COVID-19. We're just gonna give it a few more seconds here to allow people to continue joining on the webinar. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll be getting started here in just, uh, in just a few seconds. All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here, for joining us. We know there's a lot of uh, virtual and online activities going on and, and we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us in the conversation with our, with our panelists today. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started and welcome you to our webinar and then we'll jump right into the conversation. My name is Ryan Fincham. I'm the co-director of the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University. And I'll be providing you with a little bit of background information about the webinar, the webinar <laughs> series. And uh, then we'll be quickly getting into the conversation with our webinar and our amazing panelists. Uh, let me first start by welcoming you all once again. Um, we have quite a few people now that are joining us online. And uh, we would like to uh, uh, jump into the conversation here really quickly. We have a lot, a lot of content to get to. This will be the fifth webinar in this series. We've already discussed tourism in protected areas and financial resilience in protected areas in our first four webinars. And this one will be talking about the evolving role of the park ranger or the protected area ranger. CSU is the co-host of this webinar series along with the US Forest Service International Programs. Let me first provide you with this brief overview of the series, and then we're gonna start talking about protected area rangers on the front lines of COVID-19. We know that the world we live in feels very different today than it did this time last year. And there's no doubt that in this conversation, uh, we're gonna learn about things that are going on in protected areas and with community development, um, where our protected area rangers have seen a considerable change in their roles and responsibilities, that we're asking them to do more and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a lot of the, what they're doing is met with additional uh, risk as well. So we'll be di diving into that discussion here in just a minute. But just as a reminder, this 2020-2021 bilingual two-part webinar series is really focused on a broad array of global protected area issues and is entitled Protected Areas for All. And the purpose for this webinar series is to ensure that we have a space to share and connect during these difficult and, and changing, constantly changing times. Today we'll conclude, well, I'm sorry, we have, we have this session today in English and then on Thursday we have a session in Spanish also about protected area rangers. And so this week we will be concluding um, this first part on building resilience. And then in February, March and April in 2021, we're gonna start back up with our series of six additional webinars focused on equity and inclusion. So we encourage you all to stay tuned through our Facebook page uh, for more information on that second part of the webinar series. So we see quite a few of you now online joining us. Uh, the numbers are growing. We see you joining us both here through uh, Zoom as well as those of you that are joining us through Facebook Live. Thank you for, for being here. Um, as you join, and we see many of you are already doing so, please, uh, please drop in the chat where you're joining us from. We'd like to know where everybody is, uh, is joining us from so we can, 
we can really see that we are connected uh, the world over today. As we get into the panelist discussion, if you have specific questions for the panelists, we're gonna ask that instead of using the chat function, that you please use the question and answer function in Zoom. This really is the easiest way for us to track all of your questions and try to make sure they get answered either during the webinar today or in a follow-up post that we'll make uh, through our website. Uh, my colleague Jim Barbarak will be here today in the background and my colleague Aaron Hicks will also be here providing technical support. So feel free to reach out to Aaron if you're having any technical issues um, so that we can make sure uh, we, we solve any problems as they arise. And we're gonna do our best to keep this webinar series, this webinar today to, to one hour because we know you all have a lot of other things going on. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started start talking about our topic of today, protected area rangers on the front lines of COVID-19. While many of us have the opportunity and the privilege to work remotely, maybe from home, uh, we've been hearing the incredible stories of work of our protected area rangers from around the world that are working out on the front lines of conservation, out in the field with the communities throughout this pandemic. And today we look forward to hearing more stories about rangers that have been working out in the field as well as uh, from the International Ranger Federation that is connected to rangers all across the globe. And so first, now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, who's gonna take the conversation from here. I'd like to invite Jerry Kruger to the mic, who is the acting forest supervisor from the Black Hills National Forest and a long-term collaborator of ours uh, here at CSU. Um, so thanks Jerry for joining us today and for moderating uh, the discussion with our panelists. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn this show over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks so much, um, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I really um, am honored that I was selected to help uh, this particular webinar series. Uh, this is an extremely important and timely topic, and uh, I, I really thank Ryan and the folks at uh, Colorado State University for uh, allowing me the privilege to participate as the moderator this morning. Um, as uh, he indicated, uh, my name is Jerry Kruger, and uh, I just transitioned. I was the acting forest supervisor for the Black Hills National Forest for the last six months. I've returned to my role as the permanent deputy forest supervisor. Uh, the Black Hills National Forest is uh, just under 500,000 uh, hectares of uh, public land. Uh, located in the middle of the country, Western South Dakota, Northeast Wyoming, um, actually about um, 400 miles, uh, 600 kilometers or so Northeast of where Ryan and Aaron and Jim are located. Um, our public lands here are um, uh, just like everyone, uh, subject to a wide range of pressures and a global pandemic uh, has really complicated all of our lives. And this is an especially important topic for me as just before the webinar began this morning, um, I was working with one of my rangers who uh, just this morning tested positive for coronavirus and he and his family are struggling with that right now. Um, I'll uh, introduce uh, or allow uh, our panelists to introduce themselves and. The first person I see on my screen is Chris. So I'll let Chris tell us a little bit about himself. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks uh, for hosting this webinar. Uh, as you said, it was, it's a very important one at this point in time. Uh, my name is Chris Gallias, and I'm the president of the International Ranger Federation, uh, which I've been in a position since uh, November last year when we had the World Ranger Congress in Nepal, uh, fortunately, just before the COVID situation. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's been a very interesting time. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, really been a, an amazing period to be to, you know, involved in rangers around the world. And unfortunately, right now, um, it, you know, a whole lot of plans and these have really gone awry because of COVID. Uh, I'm based in South Africa and I work in protected uh, areas. I look at developing protected area um, areas, particularly in community landscapes. Uh, that's what I do most of the time. 
Um, but I've also been involved in the Game Rangers Association of Africa, uh, working with rangers across the continent. And uh, I was chairman of the Game Rangers Association of Africa for six years. So really been involved in this field for quite a few years now. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, we'll go to uh, Walter next. I see Walter. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So I think we got some bandwidth Hello. problems. Walter, Hello. we can see you and I can see your lips moving, I but I can't hear you. And we'll take a second and see if we can sort that out. And uh, can you hear me, Walter? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, so let's try it again. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I'm getting you here in Uganda. Uh, meanwhile, for you, you're in the morning. Yeah. My name is Walter uh, Odokor Ward uh, from Uganda Wildlife Authority. I'm very happy to be with you guys today. Uh, I've been a long experienced guy in conservation. I started conservation in 1993 uh, after my high school. And um, I went and did courses in wildlife management. And I came out and started working as a junior warden, came to assistant warden and uh, up to warden now as I speak. And I've worked in the all, almost all protectors in Uganda uh, at the different departments of law enforcement, community conservation, uh, all, all generally. And uh, my area of specialization now currently is community conservation, where I work to ensure to see that uh, community neighboring protected areas or where wildlife exists get benefit from conservation. I handle human wildlife conflict uh, mitigation in the areas where wildlife uh, interact with people. And uh, I also look at uh, promoting collaborative wildlife management in areas where Uganda Wildlife Authority staff and rangers cannot uh, do effectively. So we involve communities and work along with them to see that wildlife are protected both inside and outside protected area. I'm currently in Mount Elgon National Park in Northeastern Uganda. That is where my major base of uh, activities at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Walter. It's good to meet you. And thank you for participating as a panelist. Um, we'll go last to Gonzalo. Uh, Gonzalo is joining us from Chile. Gonzalo. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well and happy. Uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, join this webinar. So much for inviting me to join. Well, my name is Gonzalo Sternas. I'm a park ranger from the last 20 years, working in Torres del Paine National Park. It's one of the most and amazing places in our national conservation system in Chile, my country is located in the southern part of South America. I'd be proud to be a park ranger to make the connections to protecting Mother Nature and make the connection with the local communities. And my actual position is uh, the chief branch of conservation and protection and public use programs. So we are monitoring wildlife, giving mm -hmm. special programs to the local communities mm -hmm. and the visitors uh, fixed to the trails at a uh, mating on charge with visitor facilities and the concessions. Jerry, we can't hear you for some reason. Well, it's because my microphone was muted again, Aaron. <laughs> I forgot to wear my t-shirt that says unmute. <laughs> we'll go to Chris first with the first question. <laughs> and we've talked a little bit about this. 
Um, and, and Chris has, I, I think, a unique experience uh, in the role he plays as the president of uh, the Federation. So uh, Chris, the question is, how is your role uh, or the role of the park ranger uh, changed because of the global pandemic? Yeah, uh, we've uh, over this period of COVID, we've been tracking um, the various situations and obviously the sort of changes that rangers are experiencing in different uh, parks uh, around the world. So uh, it's definitely not uh, a single way that uh, it's changed. It's changed in many different ways for many different people. Uh, so in terms of, uh, you know, you could look at uh, Africa, for example, uh, where we have found that uh, the initial period of, of, um, of COVID, there was, there was a huge response. Rangers were found to be assisting a lot in tasks that were not necessarily uh, ranger, uh, traditional ranger tasks. Uh, so getting involved in also su supporting their communities, which has been really uh, uh, valuable. Um, but at the same time, they've also had to deal with other situations, lack of funding, for example, coming through to the parks um, and lack of operational funding. Uh, so there's two sides to that is not getting a salary at the end of the month or not as much as they used to, which then affects uh, cascades onto their families. Um, but then also from an operational aspect, not being able to carry out the duties that they are tasked to do. Uh, and so that they, those are some of the, the real challenges that they've faced. Obviously, from a, a law enforcement perspective, uh, there's been a, a lot of challenges as well. Uh, in Europe, um, th there was an initial period where people were still allowed to go out into uh, parks and so on. Uh, there's been a new appreciation for parks. And so what actually happened were places were completely inundated by people going out searching for uh, open spaces. Uh, which, which really put pressure on rangers who weren't necessarily provided with the equipment to deal with people in, under a COVID situation. So PPE, for example, was in short supply, but they had to manage people. So um, really different, different challenges faced by different rangers across the world uh, that we've been tracking. And it has been a situation where those challenges have been changing over time as COVID uh, changes have um, manifested themselves. Thank you, Chris. Um, awesome. Uh, it, I think you captured an awful lot of what, what we're all dealing with. Uh, Walter, if you can still hear me, um, you've got shaky cam. It looks like you're walking from one room to another. Um, Walter, you know, how is the role you play in conservation in Uganda and your rangers changed because of coronavirus? Uh, uh, the coronavirus greatly affected our activity in Uganda here, especially at the beginning, in uh, around the months of March, during the lockdown period. Uh, as I get a better point, because there's a lot of downfall. <laughs> All right. Um, We're getting a tour of your office. Much. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm clear. All right. In March, when uh, when COVID uh, started and the country went into lockdown, um, problems started in that uh, most uh, uh, the, our people left the urban area and went and settled near protected area, uh, fearing to move and difficulties in town. So they stayed closer to protected areas, and that one means uh, demand for protected air resources increase. Um, resources like firewood, uh, demand became, schools were closed, children were all over. So um, the threat to protected area became so much, and uh, we as rangers, we are forced to work for a longer period of time uh, to ensure that uh, we, we stop people from entering or destroying protected area resources. Um, we moved this, um, we ended up working longer time than expected. And uh, what we decided to do, uh, the management uh, uh, reduced activities from other department of tourism, community conservation, 
and we all went to law enforcement to do law enforcement activities. Um, the problem now that came in is that the young community members could send young children who are not going to school and the one taking uh, illegal activities in the park, grazing in the park, collecting, cutting trees for construction and this. So when we try to arrest uh, those children, you find a lot of chaos coming in. So uh, the community started rioting on us. Uh, there was a lot of uh, direct confrontation that really made our life much, much more difficult. COVID also affected us that with that situation, we couldn't now move home to check on our family. Uh, we are locked up like myself. My home place is about 350 kilometers away from the working place. So my family, I can't meet them. I cannot see, I cannot get in touch um, uh, with them. So our work became much, much more difficult. And uh, when we look into demand for, uh, for protected air resources, including revenue from conservation became so high because people are poor, they needed money. So they were demanding for money from revenue sharing, which we get from tourists, yet tourists are not coming. So we face a lot of challenges that uh, uh, became very much uh, crucial to us. And we ended up getting rangers, some rangers who were injured by the communities during, uh, the, during uh, as they tried to protect uh, people from destroying the protected areas. So um, our, our work became quite difficult, quite difficult. An amazing um, challenge, Walter, being um, separated yeah. um, from your from your family. That's that's mm -hmm. a tremendous burden as well, on top of the other challenges. So thank you for sharing that, uh, Gonzalo. How um, how has your life and the lives of your rangers changed? Yeah. Yeah, you know it's. Uh, COVID is a big issue and uh, uh, on these challenging times. At the beginning, uh, from this uh, issue um, and the lockdowns with the countries were near the national parks in Chile, uh, most of them are closed by the government. Uh, so that means that uh, most of the park staff has to move uh, to their homes to work work remotely from them and we missing the our nature our main task uh, that we all days made uh, on nature so on um, the first uh, time was uh, a little bit frustrated for most of the park rangers who has to move from the, their natural areas to their homes to work remotely uh, after that period we have to work made in these uh, safety protocols uh, to think in when the, in the future, when we are reopening these areas, we have to be prepared uh, for receive all these visitors on safety conditions. So uh, we have a, uh, a lot of works working on this with the local communities and with the local authorities. And uh, right now uh, we are uh, waiting for the, loans are still going up. So uh, I, we hope that in the next future, we have uh, all the parks open for the visitors. And this is a great, great, great challenge and big opportunity for all of us because people need to reconnect with nature and reconnect with themselves. Thank you, uh, Gonzalo. That's uh, a really uh, great summary as well. Uh, I'm going to transition to the second question, and I and I believe what I've heard from our three panelists, and I, I believe it's a shared experience globally, is a concern for um, the safety of our employees when there's a real shift in uh, public demand for uh, resources and access to protected areas around the world. And um, Ryan um, had prompted me with, uh, you know, a question that really relates to um, the support that our field going rangers require, not only internally from the agencies that we work with, but the expectations of the public and uh, public support 
And what I would like to hear, and Gonzalo, you're still up on my screen, would be the, the question is, how do you think the world in, in your country, Chile, and, uh, and the public in general can better support our field going park rangers and the concern around conservation of our protected areas into the future, um, which is still a lot of unknown because of uh, cure for coronavirus. So uh, I'll go to you, Gonzalo. Yeah, it's a really very uh, in interesting question. You know, uh, I think that uh, uh, on my personal point of view, I think the support of the park rangers uh, could be in one option in another way with the uh, educational programs in the formal education at the schools. So um, it's important for uh, kids and the adults and the local community to know uh, why it's important to protect nature's protector. So uh, we give them values so the uh, community can understand how important it's the work that the nature's protectors do on the field. I think it's with these um, formal educational programs uh, that's given the schools and in the open spaces with the society can get involved. It's important and meaningful uh, to me. And on the other hand, uh, we need, of course, that uh, governments uh, get involved in this situation instead of support rangers uh, work on the field and of course their families. Uh, we need to have more strong laws and support from the local governments from uh, their families when the, they don't have the ranger has because uh, most of them are have some problems in the line of duty. So uh, we need a support their families when that ranger is gone and there is no in the family. I think uh, these two options are interesting to explore like the education of the community and on the other hand, the support from the governments. And I think it is important to, to build this strong alliance with international NGOs with another part of uh, organic subgroups. I think that is uh, very important. Thank you, Gonzalo. Um, uh, Chris, from your perspective, um, working in conservation in South Africa and then your um, involvement globally in the Federation, um, what's your perspective on this? Sorry, Jeremy, can you, sorry, Jerry, can you just repeat that? Because uh, I didn't get the initial question to Gonzalo. Sure. So the, the question is, is we've talked already this morning about difficulties that our field going rangers are having uh, in, uh, in struggling with even their personal safety when there are additional demands for resources and access to protected areas. And uh, the question is, how do you think the world or, or South Africa uh, the public can better support park rangers and protected areas presently in the middle of a pandemic and then as we transition out at some point. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I think I think there's going to be quite a few phases to this of uh, the sort of uh, post COVID era. Um, so the initial one is obviously um, the situation in in quite a few places is is interesting. Um, in basically, it's it's the issue of, of resources uh, that uh, are accessible and available for for rangers to be able to carry out their tasks. Um, so I think 
you know, from a, a funding perspective, I think uh, what, what Gonzalo said uh, in terms of what I heard at the end there uh, really is true. It's about um, strengthening partnerships uh, within the NGO sector as well to support rangers, uh, in, certainly in the, in the next year. I think it's a critical period uh, for, for rangers in terms of uh, them being able to secure a lot of the biodiversity and conservation assets that they have. I think we also need to understand the diversity of those ranges and their needs. The need of an indigenous and community ranges is, and I think we mustn't forget those ranges either, um, because they certainly are ones that are under presented in a lot of the discussions and also in terms of the a lot of the the resources or being able to access resources so they are also very important players in conserving important areas and we mustn't forget that so yeah it, it's it's a very big challenge i think there's a, a big drive um from certainly from the 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 irf perspective to strengthen partnerships um, and, and that is, I think, playing a key role. We've been, we've seen it playing out in a number of other um, partnerships that are being developed. Uh, there's one in particular in Africa, the Wildlife Ranger Challenge, uh, that has been set up globally. Uh, we've set up URSA, which is the Universal Ranger Support Alliance, made up of a whole number of uh, um, organizations so support local where you can um, because that's that's the easiest place to to get stuck into and and uh, make a big difference too um, thanks very much chris i appreciate that um, walter uh, i'm going to switch the question just a little bit walter because you in in your yep. previous answer addressed many of the of the challenges that that I that Chris and Gonzalo just answered but I would ask Walter from your perspective are you seeing that your um, partnerships your collaboration with external support groups and this could even be uh, conservation groups um, amongst the public are th are you seeing those straight strengthened? improving right now during coronavirus? Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, collaboration as this period of coronavirus had been so much of helpful to us. Um, we had been having other conservation NGOs been supporting us like the African Wildlife Foundation uh, because Uganda Wildlife Authority went out of revenue due to a period when visitors were not coming. So we were a little bit uh, conscious. So uh, African, Wildlife, uh, African Wildlife Foundation came up and uh, started donating food supplies and field gears to rangers, so that uh, we could continue with our patrol effectively. This highly strengthened us. Some also donated uh, 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 the, the COVID protective action for like in to work much more harder. We really gain more strength. Then uh, other organization also came in to support us. Uh, to, to, to community wildlife scouting closer to wildlife habitat. Uh, activities like a human wildlife conflict mitigation, we couldn't effectively deploy rangers, so we had to make use of the community wildlife scouts. And the community wildlife scouts are so many that Uganda Wildlife Authority cannot fund their operation. So other NGOs came in and bridged the gap, which was really very, very effective, and uh, we are really very proud. The aspect of collaboration is going to help us much more. And uh, we also, you know, interacted with uh, uh, learning for us to other stuff in aspect of conservation. So we have been in touch with them all over the period of the hard time of the COVID. They were giving us courage. And uh, now, as I speak, 
all most of my colleagues are watching and I believe this is much more courage that uh, we shall do more and there's hope that uh, over time we shall overcome these difficulties through collaboration. Um, that's an awesome story. Thank you for sharing that with me and, and the rest of the group. Uh, that's a, a really hopeful message um, and, and allows me to transition um, to the last question that we have for the, the panelists would be um, much like what Walter described, where uh, in this case, uh, NGOs, uh, partners, collaborators have um, stepped up and provided a tremendous amount of assistance when the revenues that support protected areas have really started to um, evaporate. Those monies are, are gone or absent, putting additional challenges on our employees and the protected areas we manage. But what I'd like to hear, and, and I'll start with Gonzalo again, would be, Gonzalo, if you could share um, what I would say are some success stories, some hopeful stories that have been shared with you uh, from your staff or your colleagues uh, working in conservation in Chile. Of course, uh, I think that we have a great opportunity right now uh, in the after COVID, uh, how much important is the resilience from the national parks and protected areas. So it's, they are, we have a big opportunity to make this connection for people who is on the cities and in the towns where they spend a lot of time in a lockdown and they need to go to the outdoors and reconnect with the nature. And a uh, park range system between uh, mother nature and uh, the people, the local community. So I think it's, uh, hope it's a very important and strong a feeling that we can share with another members of the community and uh, protect areas and national parks are a great, great opportunity to, to do that instead of these amazing programs for a people stay tuned with the nature. It's like kind of um, issue that called the Shindrin Joku, what means when people have the chance to go to the forest or the nature and uh, make this deep connection. And uh, people are not the same when they're going back to their homes or their normal life. They are different. They are more nicer, they're more happy. So I think that uh, I have a lot of hope with this future in the uh, after time of COVID in this resilience period uh, and the great opportunity that, that national parks and protect areas has for all the people around the globe. Awesome, thank you. A great hopeful uh, link between our employees who are uh, working in conservation in the public. So thank you. Um, Chris, uh, could you add your perspective um, in terms of perhaps as, um, the most hopeful story you've heard from your folks who are on the front lines uh, in the last few weeks, um, it would be great to hear from you. Thank you. So uh, I think in, initially, um, and uh, just looking at uh, a South African context, as uh, it was really interesting to see how uh, initially with the lockdown, the, the, the reduced travel and movement of people seemed to reduce some of the ability of transnational wildlife crimes. Uh, this also helped some of the endangered populations where, for example, in the Kruger National Park, which is one of the largest rhino white rhino populations in the world, um, and they've been under severe threat, uh, 
April saw the lowest uh, number of poaching incidences uh, that the park has experienced since 20 or 2007. Uh, that is a huge relief um, to, to the rangers themselves uh, because, you know, encounter poaching in, in the park. Uh, but at the same time, it gave a little bit of a breathing space to the rhinos and the rhino population there, um, which, which has been under immense pressure, having lost um, just about 50% of the population in the last 10 years. So that was a, that was awesome. So I think we actually lost Chris um, uh, at the very end there, but thank you, Chris, for sharing that conservation success story uh, with regards to uh, the rhino populations. Um, Walter, uh, I'm going to twist the question it's, a little bit for you again, uh, because you ended with a hopeful message yes. to the last question about your partnerships and NGOs in the communities. And I'm wondering, what have you heard from your employees uh, that would be a success story yes. or a sign of hope from the people who work for your agency? Yeah, there's been quite a, a, a number of hope within our rangers, within our organization, uh, much as um, uh, COVID disorganizes us in terms of tourism. Uganda Wildlife Authority is growing every moment from the past period now making 20, 25 years, shortly in existence, but uh, the revenue and the capacity of our staff is really quite strong. I give example like uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Mount Elgon National Park where I'm based at the moment, um, we have uh, managed to secure all the protected area boundaries in all park encroachment has been reduced. And um, most interesting is the rangers work hard to the extent that uh, we, uh, the, 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 the population of uh, elephants emerged in Mount Elgon National Park after 30 years when we thought uh, we could not have an elephant anymore. So they migrated from Kenya and came back. And uh, we also look at uh, hope there is quite good morale from the rangers. They are motivated. The payment the organization is giving them, the government is giving them, is quite good. And their welfare for their family in terms of health, insurance, and this. So I really see so much, a lot, a lot being uh, happening. And uh, most interesting is that um, our work towards uh, protection of wildlife outside protected area is stepping up. Uh, I still give on a strong hand for the African Wildlife Foundation uh, is boosting uh, formation of conservancies in the areas where wildlife exists in the people's land. Uh, many other NGOs are coming in. So I really see quite a lot of hope that uh, conservation in Uganda is moving ahead. And uh, the rangers and the staff do all have morale, but our biggest challenge that we are facing is human wildlife conflict. This is uh, growing every moment, cases of attack on people uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, also attack retaliatory killing to wildlife is going up. And uh, it's really quite a big challenge to, to, to handle, but uh, I see in the way that we are incorporating local community to participate in wildlife management, I believe with a lot of benefit that they are getting from wildlife through tourism and other and other uses, uh, wildlife will be protected over time. Yeah. That is a, a wonderful um, story about hope and um, organizations rallying around um, the agencies that, that we work for that um, work to conserve <laughs> serve our protected areas. Um, it, it's really, it's comforting at the end of the day, at the end of a work period, where you feel that, that kind of support that's really important. Um, I'm going to come back to Gonzalo because uh, Gonzalo mentioned uh, earlier a, um, the, the link between the rangers and the public 
um, being that conduit or that link for a public education. And we have just a couple of minutes, Gonzalo, and, and I'm wondering if you could share with the group what you have seen from your rangers in terms of innovation in how to deliver the conservation message in spite of uh, COVID. Yes, thanks. The, we, we have uh, worked in, in a, a national plan to uh, with uh, the local communities and the people in general when come and visit national parks. And we called the um, special walks into the woods. So uh, people are walking under the woods and stay tuned connected with the very nice smell from the forest. It's a very, very important activity that we are working on with uh, park rangers around uh, Chile and a formal, they have formal um, uh, knowledge uh, to guide uh, groups of visitors with these very important techniques that is very millenary from Japan. Uh, it's coming a thousand years ago and we readapted to the people can take this nature deep uh, contact with them. And uh, so and passion uh, to work Uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of people from the community that have the chance to come and visit us when uh, the parks are reopened. So we are very happy with that. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that innovation. Um, I, I would just add that, um, like so many of you uh, listening and participating on the webinar uh, from across the globe, um, we're experiencing a flood of um, our communities coming onto public land to recreate. And um, we've been fortunate that actually our, our fee systems that we have in place have uh, really provided an additional revenue stream to pay for additional protection. Um, one of the interesting uh, statistics is that our uh, hunting licenses and our fishing licenses in order to hunt and fish on um, protected areas, our, our public lands has almost doubled. And in many cases, we are seeing a 500% to 1000% increase in visitation. And to hear Gonzalo talk about the personal way that his rangers have met the public as they come into the forest is really hopeful. And um, it really inspires me to help my employees who are out working with the public. So thank you. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's a sign of hope and encouragement for all of us. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn back to Ryan. Ryan has been monitoring the question and answer uh, uh, section. And Ryan, do we have a question out there? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jerry. And, and thanks uh, for, for the amazing uh, conversation and discussion thus far, guys. It's been really, it's been really amazing. Um, and I said, thanks for the discussion, guys. And so I just wanted to uh, call out uh, one particular um, detail related to this webinar is that we do not have any women rangers represented on the call today. And um, I think, you know, uh, while rangers across the world are facing challenges, we are seeing some research that's coming out um, that talks about women and some of the, the, some of the specific challenges that they're facing more broadly across all sectors during the pandemic. In fact, a recent study came out that's talked about one in four women 
are actually looking at potentially leaving the workforce because of additional stresses or demands on them um, that's caused by the pandemic. So just when in many sectors of society, we've achieved greater levels of parity and greater levels of involvement of women in the workforce, we're seeing women uh, themselves thinking that they're needing to pull themselves out of the workforce to attend to um, other life demands. And so I, I was just curious if uh, any of our colleagues would be willing to respond to a question, uh, maybe perhaps starting with Chris initially, because you may be hearing some, some things from around the world, but what are some of the additional challenges that you're hearing that women rangers uh, might be facing? Uh, during this pandemic. And, and let's start with Chris, but I'd also be curious to hear also afterwards from Walter and Gonzalo, if in each of their specific uh, country contexts in Chile and Uganda, are you hearing um, things uh, on the front lines about how women rangers are, are, are dealing with the pandemic perhaps in different ways or unique ways uh, to, to our male colleagues? And just wanted to point out that we don't have any any women rangers uh, represented here, and um, that is uh, that is something that uh, we should improve in the future. So, Chris, let's uh, let's go to you first for your response. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I think um, there have been some unique challenges uh, that that female rangers have faced. Um, I think it was a point that was raised around. Uh, the challenges that some rangers are faced in terms of getting home to their families to support their families and certainly uh, the role that women rangers have have played um, or, or in terms of their role in families has been uh, impacted on so that certainly has probably been the biggest challenge um, you know with the schooling situation as well um, mothers rangers and and, and the mothers uh, being there for their, their kids um, to to respond to the household uh, has been one of the, the certainly one of the biggest challenges that we've found, and that has been not only you know it has been found worldwide, not necessarily just uh, in 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 certain places. Um, one of the other things, just um, for for women rangers undertaking tasks that they that they haven't necessarily been, um, I think, adequately trained in to to address. Mm -hmm. Um, under these situations, under the COVID situation, so I think that's that's quite unique. Um, dealing with a, a wide range of wider range of issues, and then what they've necessarily been exposed to in the past. Uh, so those have also been something uh, that has challenged them. And I think it's important that you know it, it is a, a great point that you raise. We need to look at uh, the role of female rangers in the, the workforce. And it's certainly something from the, the Chitwan Declaration from the World Ranger Congress that uh, we are looking at as, as a federation, as, a, as, a, as, as the international ranger body, uh, we are looking to do more research to understand the value uh, of female rangers in, and the role, critical role they play as rangers in the global ranger force. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, Walter, we can go to you maybe now if you have any additional contributions on this topic. Yeah, um, for our perspective in Uganda, it is quite difficult to separate between the female ranger and the male rangers. And uh, I think because of the kind of training they underwent, you find they're doing work uniformly. And uh, of course, challenge would have come much more uh, due to their children being at home. Uh, but uh, what uh, the management decided is that uh, they should carry along their children and come along with them in the place of work. So uh, uh, since school was not on, uh, their family were living with them inside the park and it might make it much more closer for them to supervise and ensure that uh, well-being for their children are catered for. And again, uh, we adjusted the deployment since they had their family already within, uh, we took them to soft deployment, which were majorly based in the outpost that has much of, much, much of the basic facilities uh, that can uh, enable them provide easily for their family. So um, in line of patrol, we didn't see much more uh, challenge and uh, we found some of our rangers Actually, uh, the, the female rangers were even working much more harder than before the COVID. It was a big surprise when I, I deployed one of the rangers who were under my section. She opted to go to the much more challenging place, 
and uh, she said she just want to make a record. And uh, not only the ranger force, even in other organizations doing conservation uh, within, uh, within our, our reach uh, in collaboration, for example, like a conservation through public health, where the CP, the, 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 the chief executive officer is much more uh, taken up with conservation. This lady, Gladys, was the first person to take visitors to, uh, to, 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 to visit community in, 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 in Windy Impenetrable National Park last week. And the people were saying, look at this lady, she's so courageous. She brought, took there about five visitors and uh, communities were much more happy. So I really don't see much on gender aspect with this. People are really, so long as they're motivated, they have conservation within their heart, they succeed. So um, I really, it, it depends, but, uh, but, but uh, it's unavoidable and uh, good enough children are at home, people are living together and we hope things will be better. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Gonzalo, do, do you have anything else additional to add uh, from the Chilean perspective? Yeah, I think it's the, the female rangers are very important for the uh, uh, government's organization and protect areas and national parks. Uh, because I always believe in my experience that uh, all the teams when the female rangers uh, are uh, working on they do uh, their best uh, to make the, all the uh, challenges in the national parks and protect areas. And uh, I think that we develop a strong system with the parity and uh, uh, they have the same opportunities with high levels on the organization and the middle levels. I think it's the and our best way that we can try to develop a more inclusive and social opportunities. It's uh, uh, to have uh, female rangers on the, our national system. I, I think uh, they are very, very good doing uh, their task on nature and support our work uh, as a big team. I think it's, uh, it's very important to develop and give them their opportunities. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you all for that. It's, um, um, as we all remember, uh, our next series of webinars is going to be about um, equity and inclusion. And I promise my commitment to everyone listening in that uh, we will make sure we have uh, more uh, additional voices heard uh, uh, and get some of our women uh, park rangers involved uh, uh, this coming uh, this coming 2021 in our next um, series. But I just think it's important for us to uh, call this out and recognize the fact that uh, um, there may be a different additional challenges, additional barriers uh, for us to be aware of, and wherever we can to provide support uh, for our, our 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 women colleagues in the field. Um, it's it's very important. Um, I think a lot of times when we talk about uh, women rangers in the field, uh, one of the things that comes up immediately is, well, what about the family? And I think we also, uh, when it talks about, we talk about male rangers, we also need to talk about what about the family? So that we're all collectively providing that equal levels of support so that we all can do the job that we're all well-trained to do. So this is a wonderful discussion. Um, that's really the question uh, I had, Jerry, I, was, I had in mind to kick it back to you but uh, I don't know if uh, before I do final wrap up here, Jerry, if you wanna talk at all about, um, is there anything going on in the forest service in your district, uh, how your rangers are dealing with COVID that you'd like to, to, to finish us off with before we come to close? Well, thanks Ryan, I appreciate that. And I wanna thank everyone again for uh, participating today. Um, our panelists, um, especially for sharing their stories. Uh, I would just let folks know that um, the challenges we're facing are really very similar. Um, our female rangers, um, like uh, Walter uh, uh, described, are, are carrying the same load, but have perhaps a different added cultural challenge at home. Um, our schools in many cases are still closed. In many cases, our employees are 
uh, working remotely from their families for extended periods of time, especially we are still in the middle of our wildfire season here. And all Ryan and Aaron have to do is look out the window to see that they are dealing with some very large wildfires. Um, so it's just our, our families are experiencing the, those similar challenges. And uh, at my job, I see my role in many respects as trying to find any creative way I can to try and support them. And whether that's working with partners or collaborators, our communities, trying to be flexible with the hours that our employees work or how they travel to or from work. Um, it really is, um, it's, a, it's required me as a leader, as a manager to be more creative. So thanks, Ryan, I, I appreciate that. Great, thank you. Well, and uh, thank, so thanks, Jerry, for, for being with us today and for moderating this session. It was really a wonderful discussion. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, Gonzalo, Walter, and Chris uh, for their participation as well. It really was a, a wonderful discussion. Um, a, a, a huge thanks, a sincere thanks to all the Rangers, uh, men and women around the world that are working in these challenging, difficult times. Um, you have our support, you have the conservation world's support. And I think even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it because there's stress and whatever, I think you by and large have the, the, the public's support. And so thank you for everything you're doing. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us, to, uh, to the Federation, to other entities around the world that are here to provide uh, support in, in, in any way we can. Um, just as a quick reminder, uh, we have uh, our final webinar series of this, uh, of this 2020 uh, first portion uh, coming up um, on Thursday. It will be in Spanish about this same topic. So please feel free if you, if you speak Spanish or wanna practice Spanish to come back and join us on Thursday uh, to hear from Rangers from, uh, from Ecuador, from Peru and from Chile. Um, so we look forward to that. And also uh, please uh, stay in, in touch for our upcoming series on equity and inclusion where we're gonna uh, dive in uh, deeper to a number of issues um, that are really important in front, front and center if we want to truly make protected areas uh, for all, protected areas for everyone. So thank you all again to all the participants for giving us your time, for joining us. Uh, for those questions we weren't able to get to today, uh, please stay tuned. We, we will be answering those questions and posting those questions um, online. So stay tuned for those answers if we weren't able to get to them um, during the session today. And uh, just once more, thanks to my colleagues at Colorado State University and thanks to all my colleagues at the Forest Service International Programs for, for your support and collaboration. It was a good webinar. Uh, I wish you all a, a great rest of your day and please stay, stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care, everybody.